Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art, Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today I'm not in Gloucester. I'm up in North Conway at our place in the mountains. We came up for Thanksgiving. Uh, had a little snow on the day we arrived. It was pretty nice. And uh, the firewood's in for the winter, and we're all set. I hope you all had a good, uh, good holiday with your family as much as you could do, um, given the circumstances and everything that's going on. All right, one of the things I wanted to mention was a couple of you noticed it on the video that I put up on Wednesday. We had a little mistake. Uh, Sotheby's had a sale coming up on the, uh, has a sale coming up on, on, on the, around the 10th of the 11th over in Paris. And when we were sorting all the catalogs, I was a little bit of a rush. I, I pulled up the wrong catalog and I previewed the catalog from last year at the same, almost exactly the same day. And I apologize for that. A few of you noticed it. It was a nice auction. Uh, I don't remember the auction particularly uh, at the time. We may have done a video on it. I'm not sure. But um, uh, it was a heck of a nice auction. They had these great Ming's, uh, Ming bronzes on the cover. And, um, and if, if, you, if you noticed my mistake, I apologize for that. Um, uh, it just happened because we, had, we have too many PDF files floating around with catalogs in them. Okay. Anyway, that's that story. Now, over on the global member pages, we added some things this week. A lot of stuff closed this week, as a lot of you know, that subscribe. Um, we cleaned up and got them all off of there on Wednesday um, and uh, uh, Thursday, yesterday morning, Thanksgiving morning. I took off a bunch of them and uh, have replaced them with uh, new listings. And a couple of things that turned up that are coming up. One of them is a sale over in the UK at Kingham and Orn. Uh, this is a really nice, uh, they have several of these botanicals, uh, 19th century botanical watercolors on paper. Um, done uh, with uh, flower baskets uh, or porcelain vases as flower baskets with flowers coming out of them. And you may recognize the pattern because it, it, the, this same pattern is used on 18th century porcelain in the centers and also used on vases in the center. Uh, the basket, it's called the basket pattern. And um, here they are in watercolors, and there are several of them from this, from this auction house that are coming up. The estimates are very reasonable, uh, 200 to 300 uh, uh, pounds per, uh, per picture, and they're all framed. I like the old frames. They're a little bit beat up. They look, they look great. Maybe add a mat to them if you want, but uh, nice-looking watercolors and reasonably estimated. And the other thing that I wanted to point out was, was this desk. It's a very nice China trade export campaign desk from the first half of the 19th century, probably about 1810, 1825, somewhere in that window during the Jiaqing period. Uh, but a beautiful desk. Lovely example has the drop front. They used to call these butler secretaries with this drop front like that. And closed, it looks like a bureau. And here it is closed up with this big upper drawer um, on it here. And that's actually the fall front for the writing surface. And then it has this added cabinet on top, which is rather nice. These chests come apart. They're in a couple of sections. There's a good detail of the wood. Nice quality burl veneer on it. Good looking hardware. And it's got the string out, white string outline that you see. It's a maritime thing. You also notice it on teak work on boats that you would outline things in white. But you notice it has two sections with handles because there's a line here. And this case comes apart. And the reason they call them campaign chests is because they were portable. People used to take them into military campaigns, that sort of thing. And that's where the name came from. But you'll notice the upper section has a set of handles and as do the lower section. So it all comes apart. And this has a very reasonable estimate. If you're in the New York area and you're looking for a really great piece of furniture, uh, you want to check this out. It's fairly nice. It's 71 inches tall, by the way. It's about six feet tall and around four feet wide, a little over a little over uh, three and a half feet wide, rather. And this is uh, South Bay Auctions in uh, uh, New York. So uh, check those guys out. That's a good looking piece of furniture. And then on the newsletter page, a lot happened this week. There were a lot of things. Uh, Catawiki had an enormous amount of material, a lot of Chinese material that did quite well. And they, they had increasing numbers, amounts of Japanese material. If you're a Japanese buyer, um, you want to start checking Catawiki out pretty regularly. They have a lot of Japanese uh, uh, antique sellers over in Europe. And they're putting a lot of their stuff on Katawiki. And uh, the, the sales uh, all did pretty well uh, across the board. And we're going to go through the numbers and give you an idea how it was. Uh, one of the things that did pretty well was this, this very nifty little Kangxi jar, but very freeform in its decoration. Uh, uh, seven, uh, 17th century Kangxi, it looks like. I like the bamboo decoration. Now, the way the flowers are done, and this is not a big jar. It's only about four or five, in, five, five and a half inches tall, as I recall, 
but a good example. Nicely done. And it ended up selling for $546. And I think mostly for its age, because you notice the decoration is very similar also to pieces you would see on transitional wares. Okay. And then over here to this, the um, this was a, a UK cooler had this up, uh, a pair of these Kung Shi pear-shaped vases with garlic necks on them. Um, and uh, one of them had a repair on it, the old repair right here on the neck of the vase. I think whoever bought it will probably get that cleaned up. But it's done with these nice looking cartouches in the shape of, pom shape of pomegranates. And then they put goo form vases in them. Uh, uh, looks like, like a bronze vase with flowers coming out of it. And then other flowers floating around it. Very nice pattern. Very attractive. And uh, these did pretty well, even though one of them had a restored neck. Brought $1,175. Had they both been perfect, I suspect they would have gone for over $2,000. Uh, because pears are highly desirable. And this this type of decoration with that, that, that dark uh, blue background, cobalt background, is a uh, very effective visually. And uh, I think that the 1171 was fine. Somebody will get that repair cleaned up and they'll be in good shape. And then on to this really interesting and rather unusual Femi Ver Kung Shi dish with these shaped rim with these little cash symbols in each, each, each of the shapes, uh, each of the little uh, openings around the outside. Very attractive. And you notice that on the top of the plate and at the bottom, they show a scene of scholars objects, vases and books, rue scepters coming out of, uh, out of uh, sleeve vases, scrolls and so forth. And then they mirror it on this side. And then at the bottom, they had a similar arrangement with more uh, silk wrap, silk ribbon wrap uh, books and scrolls, and then repeated again on the other side. So they managed to balance the plate that way quite successfully. And then the center panel, they gave it an asymmetrical layout with a building on one side, rooftops, a balustrade, and then oversized uh, uh, vases coming up in the behind it, just full of flowers. Just a very interesting uh, and very well thought out uh, dish from a design standpoint, uh, quite, quite exceptional. And the plate did well. It sold for $753. And this was not an enormous plate. I think this was around 12 inches or so in diameter, eight inches in diameter, not even, uh, 24 centimeters, but uh, a little over nine inches or so, but good looking, good looking plate, and an unusual pattern. Uh, always go for those. And then on to this, the uh, shell-shaped uh, Kang Shi period dish with the brown dressing. This was a nice one. It's very free form. The, dry, the drawing on it, you notice, is very freely done. Um, it's not particularly symmetrical, just meandering vines going everywhere, which I think is nice. And um, has this nice brown dressing going around the outside. And here's the handle down here. There's a tiny nip out of the uh, brown dressing in that upper left at about 11 o'clock on it. But other than that, it was in good shape. And it went for a very reasonable price, I think. $152.50 from uh, ceramics and collectibles. That's the Shangri-La guys, as we, as we call them. Um, nice things. They always have stuff up on eBay every week, and they are linked also. If you want to go see their store, as a reminder, if you come over to, uh, I'll do it real quickly. Uh, if you come over to um, uh, the Bitamount homepage, we've added a link to their site off the page right here in the blue boxes down at the bottom. <laughs> Um, and we just called it the uh, Shangri-La Antiques Amsterdam. There they are. And that's uh, um, Bob Montague and Freak Pals. They run the place. And uh, they have that, their site is loaded with, with, with porcelain. And uh, if you have something you like, get a hold of them directly. And you can, uh, you can haggle with them. Okay. Uh, let's see here. And that plate, as I said, did $152. And now over here to this, this bronze. Uh, this was a nice looking bronze. Uh, the, the fellow that had this uh, sent me an inquiry about it because he knew quite a bit about it already. I think he just wanted to uh, get some outside thoughts when he was doing his listings. He had this bronze and another bronze that's coming up. That, and they both did very, very well. But this is a nice uh, Qing uh, silver inlaid uh, incense burner, beautifully done with an under tray. Uh, and if I had it, I'd probably take a tiny bit, not polished, but silver foam maybe, and lightly go over it to bring up the silver inlay, the wire inlay in the body. Um, let's see here. Pull that up there. You can see it, but it would come up quite a bit if you just lightly, lightly um, use some foam on the, uh, uh, you don't want to abrade it. You don't want to rub it down and polish it. You just want to get a little silver foam on there maybe just to pull off some of the tarnish to help the decoration. Anyway, this did pretty well. It brought $628. Good looking incense burner. And then over to this, this is a Xuantong marked um, incense burner with the, this nice stipple ground, which you see on Ming bronzes. And then these meandering uh, lotus vines uh, running around the top. 
and these handsome little mask handles on the ends. This is a good looking uh, uh, example. And as I said, it has this one tongue mark on it and there's a whole big debate about those marks because the period was so short. Um, the general consensus is almost nothing was made during that period with that mark. Very, very, very little. And certainly not a lot of bronzes. And people generally understand that and accept it. My view of this bronze is that it was probably made within 10 years of the period and expertly well done, beautifully done. But the interest in things, anything with that mark, this Xuantong mark, is uh, very high. Um, and uh, as, as such, it brought a lot of money. It did very well. It brought $2,568 just because it's a rare bird. And it's part of sort of a controversy about these pieces because they don't have much in the way of records from things that were made during this time. And there's this whole debate between a couple of camps going back and forth that it was made in the period. And other people say it wasn't. And I think it's going to remain like that forever because that debate has been going on for 30, 40 years at this point, maybe longer. All right, now over to this, this very nice um, uh, signed, uh, uh, PK, uh, a pewter rather, uh, covered box done in the Ming style with these gilded lacquer uh, reticulated open areas of, of pheasants among flowers and birds among flowers. This is a really interesting little piece. It's, it's late Qing. It has the uh, um, a stamp mark in the bottom. Uh, most of these came out of, as you know, came out of the Swato area of China, so the south uh, southeast uh, coastal area. But a nice looking piece of pewter. And I think pewter is just crazily undervalued and underappreciated. And they had some of the best pewter uh, workshops in all of China in that region that made this. And as you can see, it's very much in the style of Ming bronzes and so forth. And I think it was a great buy, $201.28. You can't beat it. And it was nice size, handsome, and uh, something you'd enjoy owning. And that's really the most important part of doing all of this. And then on to this, the Cantonese card case. Um, you're not supposed to sell ivory on eBay, but God knows in Europe they sell a lot of it. And uh, this is a really good example. A beautiful early uh, first quarter of the uh, 19th century Cantonese case made for the export market. Uh, and they added this nice little like maritime rope twist around the outside, trimming it. And then, of course, used, they shaped the box. These sun, most of these are square in, in general. They don't shape the bodies. This one is shaped. It has like the tips of little rue heads running around the outside and four points going about it. And it was, it was in good shape. Uh, one of the things that often happens to these boxes is that the receiver on the top where the cover fits over gets chipped and damaged over time, breaks off. Often you'll see a whole chunk of it knocked out because that part of the, uh, the ivory was very, very, very thin. Not as thin as paper, but not much thicker. And uh, they, they were highly prone towards chipping and getting caught on things and breaking. This one looked to be in great shape and ended up selling for $639. Um, and this was from a seller also in the UK. All right, and now over to this, the teapot. Very interesting and very unusual teapot done in the Chinese taste, uh, but done on an export porcelain teapot of the uh, women behind a uh, walled garden and an elderly woman being brought along in a rickshaw, uh, being pushed along with her fan and so forth, sort of a leisurely scene. Um, here's a picture right behind the handle is where the gate to the garden is. You can see the handles here and... Uh, more women looking over it, and the, and the gate is flanked on each side by these utong trees. Nicely done all the way through, and there's the scene repeats on the other side of the pot. And a very unusual pot, very unusual to have that pattern on export porcelain, and ended up doing pretty well, $727. Not because the pot, that pot in just underglazed blue would have been worth less, but with that pattern of, of, of uh, a decoration in that form, it makes it quite unusual and interesting. And uh, the kind of thing that even the Chinese mainland buyers are buying these days because of the decoration, because that similar decoration you can see on Chinese domestic bowls and so forth. And then along over this, this great big cobalt blue decorated late 18th century teapot with, um, uh, with this beautifully shaped spout and conforming handle. The thumb ring is on top. Nice underglazed blue decoration with a berry finial on the, on the top of the thing. Here's a view. There's the uh, peacock feather as they often painted on the spouts and on the handles down the back. You see these in particular on late 18th century export pots. But a beautiful piece, and this thing was big. This thing was like eight inches tall, eight inches wide. Very good size, big gutsy teapot. Ended up selling for $703, but it was also in great condition. 
this was from Miggy Larry, and he has another one up. He had a couple of these. I think he had a collection of teapots. He has another one up right now that is almost identical looking, but it's not the same teapot. I did check because I couldn't understand that he'd have two that were absolute matches, and if they were absolute matches, why he didn't sell them as a pair? They weren't absolute matches, but they're very similar. Um, I don't think the other one is quite as big as this, but but a very nice one, and that will be in the newsletter this week when we update the page. All right, this one brought $703. And then over here to this, a nice little pair of uh, rose mandarin, uh, um, little mantle or shelf faces. These weren't big. Uh, these were around five inches high in height, but nicely decorated circa 1860 or 70, I would guess, by the decoration. And they sold for $246, which is fine because they're unusual small size. This form of vase typically is bigger, 12 to 14 inches. So this was sort of an interesting, if you have the bigger ones and you had this to go with it, it would be fun to have for comparison. And then on to this, this uh, really lovely pair of uh, export plates with the Chinese boy riding the ox and geese. And these are very unusual. And it's, it's again, uh, Chinese export porcelain that was done in the Chinese taste. Uh, and you notice the minimalist rim around the outside of it. Not a lot of activity here on the rim. Just a very simple um, gilt uh, and outlined in red uh, vine pattern running around the outside. And at, at the top of each, you have a couple of ascending geese and then more geese on the ground and the boy on the ox. Beautifully done. For some reason, um, this is Michelari sold these also. He, he forgot to put the dimensions in because these plates in this pattern, in this shape with that shaped rim can come in any size really from you know eight or nine inches up to 18 inches. So it's a pretty wide range. However, most of them are in the 11 to 13 inch range that we've seen. So I suspect that's probably where they were, uh, especially when you look at the, sh the, the stand uh, that looks like a, a fairly standard size stand. So that would pin these in at you know 11 to 12, 13 inches in diameter. At any rate, they did well. It sold for $691, but again, the Chinese taste uh, uh, pattern uh, has a big impact on the value. And then over here to this, the big covered uh, jar um, with a sort of quasi Chin Lung mark on it. It's a late Qing jar, but a beautiful form, beautiful shape, and it was big. It was superbly well decorated and in good condition. Those, all those things add up to um, a lot of interest for, for collectors especially, but the shape is quite unusual. It's, a, it's an 18th century shape, and uh, uh, the, the decoration, the shading of the cobalt goes from almost black in places, like uh, here how it's framed around the top and the way the roux heads are done, to very, very, very light blue. Lots of range of cobalt on this. And uh, in the end, it did just fine. It brought $2,135, but it was a nice thing. It was just an absolutely nice thing. Beautifully done. And then on to this, the uh, Yong Chen to early Qinlung period export plate with the female rose and the uh, flycatcher in, in the center of the, or the, or the, or the, or the phoenix, uh, depending on how you, uh, how you look at them. Um, I guess that's more of a phoenix given the, the shape of his head. But at uh, any rate, it's a beautiful plate with this uh, nice uh, outer border of half flowers running around it and these scrolling areas, these little scrolling cloud patterns that you see. You also see that same pattern on a Mar Japanese porcelain. But uh, this one is obviously Chinese, and it's, they have this very nice light blue enamel coming up the inside of it. And it has, you notice it has little pinholes in it. Uh, that light blue enamel was prone to that. These little little chips and bumps and stuff when it fired it would form bubbles and often chip off. It wasn't unusual. It wasn't. This isn't damage to the plate. It's just how the enamel uh, itself reacted during the firing process. And uh, you notice the the, the uh, female rose is a nice deep deep red. Uh, very, very dark, and then fades to white on the tips of the flowers, and that's a good sign. And the female rose is very deep and dark, which is nice. And they, they sold for this sold for $181, which I think was perfectly reasonable. Nice-looking plate with a shaped rim, faceted rim. And then over for this. This was something that uh, uh, Arts on Sunlink.net, Mark Wahlberg, had up. He's a seller who's been around forever in Pennsylvania. He gets good things. Um, he travels all over. He's a very active dealer, good reputation. This was a nice copper red, uh, 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 sort of almost Kang Shi looking uh, snuff bottle. And you notice how the, the uh, white area up here leans towards green a little bit because there's probably some elements of copper oxide in it, and that's what it can do sometimes in the firing. But this was a nice looking little, little snuff bottle. I liked it. 
Here's a picture of the back of it. You notice how it bloomed through the white body, bloomed through the, the copper on the on the other side. Just a good little little pot. And ended up selling for $177, perfectly reasonable. He had no reserve on it. Um, he does both. He does reserve and unreserved sales. This one had no reserve and uh, uh, did just fine. But if you're a stuff bottle collector, that was a nice thing. Had a nick in the foot, but it wasn't significant. And then on to this, the Kangxi dish. This was around a 10-inch dish, as I recall, I believe, uh, with a silver mount swing handle on it, done in Europe, probably done either in up in the Netherlands somewhere or in the UK. They didn't do a lot of silver mounts on French porcelain. They didn't do it much in Spain or Italy, but they did a lot of it in Northern Europe and in the UK. It's a very stylish thing to do, and you would you would put these out on a table with some sweets in them or snacks or cookies or something. But the pattern of the plate is very nice, and it's very reminiscent of Wan Lee examples, the slightly earlier than the Kung Shi period, with these radiating lappet panels running out from it, and then the center just filled with a profusion of flowers. It was a nice-looking thing. Here's a picture of the rim, um, and there are those lappets coming out filled. Here, here again is that... Uh, that, that peacock feather thing that you see on late 18th century teapots. Here they've used it here on, as one of the alternating panels uh, as it radiates out from the center. And this was a nice looking thing and it ended up selling, I think, pretty reasonable with the silver mount. 325 euros, which is perfectly fine. That's a nice looking object. And then some of the things over in Katowiki that did well um, was this, this very nice uh, uh, Kosometsuki uh, or, or Wan Li uh, transitional period um, bowl, shallow bowl. And what I liked about this in particular was that, it, we'll get to it in a second, get back, it has a molded, molded, uh, molded body and it's, it's a bowl. They have it listed as a dish. I don't know why. It's a bowl. And uh, what's nice, it has that basket. We talked earlier about that watercolors at the beginning of the video that have the flowers coming out of it with the baskets that is a well-known pattern. Well, here it is again in a more compressed form. But you notice in the, in the, on the vase on the bottom that's holding the flowers, they used an archaic mask to build that was de decorated into the vase, which is unusual. And uh, he's, he's almost cross-eyed looking. It's pretty funny. And, uh, and then you have the flowers coming out of the top, the shape framing around that scene, and then molded relief decoration into the porcelain, the white part of the porcelain itself. And it was in perfect condition from what I could read. And it sold, I think, uh, pretty reasonably, 356, 356 euros, rather. I think that was a good buy for somebody who collects late Ming to transitional period porcelain because the, the pattern was interesting, an unusual pattern. And then over to this. This was one of the niftiest things that I've seen all I had seen all last week. It's a cup in a barrel form, the well-known barrel garden garden seat form, but it's a little cup. And what's interesting is that the ones I've seen in the past were always done just in underglazed blue. This one is underglazed blue with overglazed enamels and, and a Chinese Amari palette. Um, I think this is quite old, 18th century, maybe early 18th century. But it has that nifty little uh, upper border, the circles and the X's, which you also see on Japanese porcelain. Um, the Japanese uh, borrowed it from the early Chinese Kung Shi pieces and so forth. And here you have it up here um, running around it. And then this very nice decoration. And I love the, the, the mask of the uh, Fu line because they, they, they did these, uh, the curls of the hair are like big uh, light, light, light blue domes off the top of his head off the top of the head and there's a picture of the bottom that nice dense white paste um it looks like a, it sure looks like a kung shi pot to me he just had it as qing dynasty and some people might not have maybe caught on that uh, quite how old this thing was and it ended up selling very reasonably i think 223 euros i think that was a great buy that was a good looking thing and unusual and rare and small as a cup it wasn't it wasn't a little stand here's a picture of the top of it there it is down inside really nifty and then over to this, this fabulous Shibuyama piece. Let me get back to the picture of this. Shibuyama has, hasn't been bringing a lot of money for a while now, and I don't understand why. I think it's grossly undervalued. And this was a, a superb example, with the, most of the body being made up of silver with, an, uh, with a central panel running around it of ivory and then overlaid with mother of pearl and enamels and semi-precious enam semi -precious, uh, bits and these nice looking food lion dragons coming up the sides and then the, this very proud goose sitting on the top. Uh, just a, a, a terrific package. It was around six or seven inches tall, but superb quality. And it looked like it was all intact. I couldn't find anything really wrong with it. 
Um, uh, the enamels all look very, very good to me still. Uh, the uh, relief work was good. It wasn't damaged. The wires, there's no bends in them anywhere. The dome's not bent. Overall, it's in nice condition. And I uh, ended up selling a well-deserved 1,600 euros against a two to 3,000 euro estimate. And what that tells me is, is that, is that increasingly, Katowiki, I think, is finally getting their sellers to say, okay, you can put whatever estimate you want on it, but try to keep the reserves more on the reasonable side. Keep them lower. And in this case, obviously, the reserve was uh, well below the low estimate by at least 400 euros or $600 below it. And I suspect uh, it may have been even lower than that. But it was a good-looking piece of Shibayama. And if you like that kind of thing, uh, these pieces turn up on the Katowiki site fairly often. So, um, and we'll have them in the newsletter page. If you, if you looked at the newsletter page last week, you noticed how huge the, the Katowiki section was at the bottom. And it's just because they've got so much stuff up right now in both the Chinese and Japanese categories. And lots of Subas. If you're a Suba buyer, boy, that's the place to buy Subas. And then on to this, this outstanding Okimono. This is one of the nicest Okimono I've ever seen. Uh, absolutely great quality and it's signed and it's it's the demon and, and neo and the the, the uh, i mean the, the the guardian neo and and odin um o, o, oni excuse me the demon this fanged creature here and he's being picked up in a judo move and getting ready to be tossed um uh which is how they the, what he's supposed to be doing to him but uh the carbon quality of this was absolutely out of this world absolutely stupendous elephant ivory carving Probably Indian elephant, judging by the color, um, the facial expression of the of the of the beast, um, the eyes, the brows, all the little details, and the the way the skin and the, the stomach, the belly button, the, everything is on here. It's really really something, and I ended up selling um, for uh, let's see here 2,800 euros, which I think was perfectly reasonable. Um, it was signed by a pretty well-known carver, uh, and I think he included o, uh, Oga, Ogawa, o, Ogawa Haruyuki. And he did mostly ivory work, and he did some other, other, other carvings. He did some wood, wood, work and, uh, woodworking, uh, wood carvings, and that kind of thing. He focused mostly on Netsuki's and uh, Okimono's, uh, from what I know of him. And this was one of his best. This was absolutely stupendous. And... Uh, uh, I don't know where, where the buyer lives, but uh, hopefully they live in a place where it can be legally shipped. <laughs> and then on to this, this uh, Ka Chinese Kangxi period Amari plate. I liked this a lot. And the reason I liked it was one of the things they did that was pretty clever was they created these um, these these lotus form and alternating with circles, roundels around the outside on the, on the uh, rim. And how they divided them was with these vines. And they had the vines creep around and jump up between each roundel and each uh, uh, lotus blossom around here. And then in the center, that all of that created a, a vine center where this framed area of this terrace with a tree with a fruit tree in the middle. Just a very, another another good composition. Um, I think the, I think his lighting is a little bit off here because this thing isn't that dull looking. But um, use good lights when you take pictures, for heaven's sakes. And uh, it ended up selling for 270 euros, which I don't think is at all unusual or, or unreasonable for that because it was a nice looking example and it had an interesting pattern to it. And it was 35 centimeters in diameter. So it was about 14, 13 and a half, 14 inches wide, which makes it a charger. And uh, in the picture, it looks like a little dish. Um, um, and uh, that somebody, I think, got a very, very nice buy on that. And then over here, if you're a Japanese buyer of traveling shrines, this was a nice one. It was a Meiji period example. Uh, they just listed it as 19th century, but it's pretty clearly Meiji. But nice quality. Here's the figure with the, with the Buddha, Buddha Safa standing in the center of it. And you notice they did nice relief work on the door panels, which they did on some of these. Sometimes they left them plain. This one they added some extra gilding and so forth of, of lotuses. Uh, the carving looked all uh, pretty, pretty legit for uh, Meiji period work. And it was around 12 inches in height, roughly. Ended up selling for uh, 425 euros, which is right in the range for these. These 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 days seem to be running anywhere from 350, 375 dollars, depending on quality and condition, up to about 700 in this size. Once they get bigger, the price goes way up. When they get up to be 20 20 inch shrine shrines and and, and, and those 24 inch ones, then they're 1500, 2000, and so forth. But that's a, this is a nice looking one. 
um, as long as they have their cases. The cases are very important. And this is something I put in the newsletter last week because I thought somebody would buy it. Um, it had a very, this seller is for some reason puts enormous opening bids on his things. And, and, and as a result, he doesn't sell a lot of stuff. He's down in Connecticut. But this was a very nice Hongmu period, 15th century Ming um, uh, uh, plate. Uh, these were typically made for the uh, export for the Southeast Asian market into Indonesia and uh, that area of the world. But a beautiful example with these big fat flowers, very typical of Hongmu workmanship. And this, this uh, uh, pheasant in the center, uh, let's see here, get, get another look at it. There it is up close, nice crackle on the glaze, all completely legit. This was a nice early plate. Here's a picture of the back of it, like the foot rim on it, like the, the crackles, the vertical crackle running up and the decoration on the outside of the plate. And he had a sort of a big estimate, a big opening bid on it, $999. Um, uh, I don't know why he would do that. Uh, and what happens is, is that because of eBay's Cassini, if it sees something like this with a big estimate, it compares it to other pieces of the same period. And if it gets no bids and doesn't get a lot of views, and it won't get a lot of views because he has a high estimate, on, high opening bid on it. Um, it doesn't get a lot of attention from the search algorithms that eBay uses, and it didn't sell. All right. And somebody probably could have picked this up for one bid, for a single bid. Uh, at any rate, uh, that was too bad. That was a nice piece. It was around 12 inches in diameter, as I recall. Good big piece, 15th century uh, uh, Ming, Ming plate. Nice piece. And then over here to this. This I love. This was a, a they got, the seller had a couple of these up, these, these uh, China trade tea processing uh, paintings. Nice landscape views, first half of the 19th century, 1810, 1820 probably, uh, and, and looked to be in quite good condition. Um, and here you have the, 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 you know, the patty in the background, and you have people processing tea up in here. And uh, ended up selling for $225, which I think was a really, really good buy. This was a seller out in Minnesota, Lion Goods. They have a good eye. They get things periodically. And when they do, they're usually quite nice. And this one, he had at least one other of these watercolors. And uh, we'll keep an eye out in case he has some more to put up. But uh, nice looking, nice looking thing. All right. And then what's coming up this week is uh, Migalari is closing out a bunch of lots. This is all, all the stuff will be in the newsletter this weekend over on Bid Amount. Uh, so if you subscribe, you'll get the email um, notice that it's been updated. This was a, a, a lot that he has on there right now, of, um, mostly 19th century, some early 20th century things, Republic period things, but some nice looking porcelain. There is an 18th century export vase in there and so forth, some nice carvings. I want to uh, take a look at that. And uh, one of the things he has up right now is this reticulated bamboo brush pot, uh, late Qing, but interesting because it has a battle scene running around the outside. Fortunately, the body has a crack in it. I gotta see if I can find the crack. Here it is. And this thing desperately needs to be given some humidity and that crack will eventually close up. Just uh, wrap it gently with some, 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 some silk thread or something and just pull it together, let it sit in a humid room and those, that piece will form mostly right back together. Um, the, the central heat just cracks these pieces, something terrible, just like it does ivory. That's all from, that's from dry heat and stress causes that. And uh, you want to take care of those. At any rate, it's got a dollar sixty bid on it right now. It's got uh, almost nine days to go. It just, as I said, these just went up. These just went up by, uh, last night. And then on to this, Digger Studio has this up. He's a seller here in Massachusetts. He gets good things. Is this nice looking um, uh, bronze, uh, late Ming to early Qing bronze bull with the moonrise behind him, and the moon is being done sort of in the shape of a is 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 done in the shape of a detachable uh, Chinese mirror. And here's the the ring that sits on top of it. Nice looking example though. A good surface. It's, he points out it's got an old repair to the uh, holder for the uh, for, for the uh, plaque or for the mirror. And uh, here's the surface, good looking surface, that nice brown area as you wanna see. And uh, down here in these crevices where it's a little bit rough from the casting is how it should look. It's up to $3,000. It's got a couple of days to go. It closes on Sunday. It's around four or five, five inches or so in, uh, in, in length and maybe five and a half inches in height. But unusual and very unusual with a detachable mirror. I like that. And then uh, Richwood Fine Arts has this up, this nice looking dragon, a silk round doll with a dragon and gold with gilt threads running through it. And those nice light blue, almost periwinkle blue uh, cloud, roof, roof, roof head form clouds 
coming up and then there's a cluster of them in waves at the bottom. This is a nice looking object and uh, it's up to $2,025. It closes tomorrow. I suspect it'll probably go up another four to 600. Uh, that's what they typically sell for, but we'll see. The, the silk market is very strong. There's a lot of people that collect old silks and this is a nice one. This is probably an early 19th century example. And then over to this, the crucifix with inlaid with mother of pearl. There was, there's a whole group of these uh, that were produced in China for the Christian community. Um, and this, this was a nice one. And one of the things I really liked about it was, I want to find the right picture here. Um, if you look at it carefully, they use as a, as a, as a chalice or a wine goblet. Um, uh, the, into it, they've, they've put in these, um, these floating Chinese clouds, uh, Ling Bai form clouds. And then on the inside of it, you notice they use the same wave pattern that they used on 18th and 19th century porcelains, mo most often done in either green enamels or underglazed blue. And this was sort of an interesting element to it. And uh, here you have the ascending dove inside the, uh, the wreath of thorns and all that, a lot of Christian symbolism in there, but also done in the Chinese style. These sell for, and he's, he has a picture of it in there from one of the catalogs. These typically sell for $1,500 to $2,500. This right now, just as, as I mentioned, this fellow started it also with a big opening bid of $995, and he's managed to get one bid. And unfortunately, if that one bid came in very recently, it's, it's, gonna, it's not gonna get a lot of attention, again, from eBay's search algorithms. Um, to push it into the, into the into the you know the face of buyers, so that'll be in the newsletter page. If you like this kind of thing, this is a nice one. And then on to this, uh, Josh Chamberlain Juice One Four Nine Nine um, has this up. He's got a, a, a group of Chinese things. They weren't there last week when I did the newsletter, so they didn't make it in. I guess they came up. Um, I haven't heard from Josh in a little while, but they um, they they this must have come in around eight o'clock that night. They must have launched. And he's got a number of good Chinese things. This is a pair of large, uh, most likely Republic period, uh, turquoise glazed uh, figures done in the Ming style. They're 16 and a half, 17 inches tall. They're big. And they look to be in very, very nice condition. Here's a picture of the bottoms. They have that, 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 that rectangular seal uh, that you see on these uh, Republic examples. The pace looks Republic. The thickness of the bottom looks Republic. And this sort of uh, you know, sandy brown texture what you see on these but these are quite handsome quite big uh, and they're elegant I really really like them and as I said seven almost seven 16 and three quarter inches I think is the height on these they're up to just hundred and twenty seven dollars they close on Monday uh, expect them to bring fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred but uh, maybe more who knows if somebody really loves them because they're unbelievably decorative and then he also has this up, this great looking uh, silver mounted Edwardian, it looks like Edwardian silver to me, it's European silver, onto a reticulated Wan Lee blue and white bowl with, the, with these, uh, with these uh, so again, Rue head lappets. This is this pattern you often see around the bases of Yan and Ming pieces. Um, and here they use them as, uh, as frameworks for the reticulated windows into them. Uh, very attractive. Let's see if we can get another picture there. Get a better shot of the handles. These these sort of diamond cut uh, silver handles. Beautifully done though. Beautiful, probably Edwardian. And it's up to two hundred and eight dollars, and it closes also on Monday. And then popping over to some of the things that are up on Catawiki right now is this very nice. He has it up as 18th century. It could be early 19th century. It's terribly difficult to tell. Uh, bronze brush pot, but it's done in the Ming style with all that reticulated open work on it. It's very handsome. Uh, these don't turn up very often. They're quite unusual. It has a very smooth bottom, so it makes me think it might be early 19th century. Uh, and the foot rim is very shallow, but a beautiful example and a great patina. Whoever made this knew how to apply a patina. It's up to uh, 500 euros. It's, it closes in uh, about, about a day from now. It closes on Saturday. And it does have a, um, uh, let's see, the reserve has been met at 500 euros. So the, the, this is going to sell. It's got a 1,900 to 2,200 uh, euro estimate, which isn't crazy. These, these kinds of pots have turned up at bottoms. I think Woolley and Wallace had one a few years ago, as I recall. Um, in the, about, the, about in that price range, I think one of them brought 1,600, one of them brought 2,400. So if you can buy it for um, you know, 500 euros, you've got a good deal on your hands, I think. 
And then over here to this, the Kangxi footed vegetable server. Uh, very unusual piece of Kangxi porcelain. It's late Kangxi, uh, very, very much toward the end of the period with these, um, uh, these, these narrow vertical bands. They did plates occasionally in a similar pattern. And then these cobalt, underglazed cobalt blue feet. It does have a crack in the body, but it hasn't held people back. It's gotten a lot of interest. And part of it is this sort of almost famille rose enamel around the top, which is we've talked about many times that, that shading started coming in during the end of the Kangxi period. This is really more of a light orange than, than famille rose, but it's in that same general manner. And uh, it's up to 998 euros. Um, whatever the reserve was, it has been met and it has an 1100 to 1300 euro estimate. And I think it's it's getting right up there. I think you, you, you it may bring 12 or 1400 euros by the time it's done, but a nice looking piece of Kung Shi. And then this is, uh, I think Digger Studio again, has this, this nice looking Chinese export. Yeah, it is Digger Studio. Uh, has this nice looking Chinese export dragon handle relief work um, tankard. Uh, a very well known type. But what was inter interesting is if you, if you look at a number of them, you line them up side by side, you, you, you can see entirely different scenes. They didn't copy scenes too much. They were always a little bit different, uh, whether they were imperial court scenes with people approaching, um, you know, on horseback outside the palace or uh, being greeted or people in gardens. It, it really varied. Uh, but beautiful quality, probably made around 1890 to 1910 Chinese uh, workshop, maybe in uh, Shanghai or someplace. $348 uh, is the price on it right now. It'll probably go up. It'll probably go to seven or 800, I suspect, by the time it's over. But leave a bid, for heaven's sakes, if it's still down in this range, you might get a bargain. Uh, two days to go, closes Sunday. All right, and then over to these. Uh, these are a handsome pair, uh, a, a very, very attractive pair of uh, uh, Republic period Famille Rose planters. These are not enormous. These are like seven inches tall or something, seven or eight inches tall, seven or eight inches wide. But they look great with small plants in them, maybe a small a couple of bonsais, buy a pair of small bonsais, put them in, or f small flowers. But the decoration on them is, is just excellent, and they mirror each other. These are not a match pair. They're a mirror pair, which makes them more desirable. In other words, the books are on the far left here and on the far right here. If they were just matched pair, then they would look exactly the same um, in both directions. But there's a nice Famille June decoration uh, that's been applied to the flower boxes and this big rose enamel uh, vase with bamboo trees coming up in the middle and then flowers exploding out of the top. Very attractive, very nice looking. And as you see here, the uh, garden, the gate bell, um, is all in gilt with red outlining, just like we saw in that 18th century plate. That style of decoration um, came back a good bit during the Republic period, um, as we saw in that pair, the ox, the, the oxen, uh, the boy riding the ox, and they used that that gilt and out traced uh, outlined red enamel, uh, and they used it, they were still using it in the early 20th century. And here you see something you could easily miss: is this white enamel on white porcelain outlined, and then clouds in red teapot. All right, lots of interesting things on this. This thing was really thought out well. It's up to $155, closes on Sunday, and if you can buy the pair for under $700, you got a good buy. They'd be wonderful. If you buy them, put plants on them, for God's sakes. And then on to this, this is the last piece we're going to look at for the day, is this very nice rose medallion. Um, at a glance, you'd think it was rose mandarin, but it's actually rose medallion, technically. Um, uh, Mid-19th century, 1840, 1850, uh, baluster vase. And this is a big one. These are sort of unusual. This one is 17 inches tall. Probably was once a pair with another vase. But nicely done, beautiful quality decoration, and big. And uh, that's a that's a good thing. It's up to five hundred and nineteen dollars. I suspect it'll probably go up another four or five, six hundred, maybe before it's over. If it goes for less than that, somebody got a good buy. And uh, but a nice looking thing. And that about it for the week. That's about it for the week. If you haven't subscribed to us yet here on YouTube, please do. And uh, come over to bitamount.com and subscribe to the weekly newsletter. It's completely free. And if you, that's not enough content for you, uh, sign up for the weekly uh, global member pages. For the it's a, it's about four, it's four bucks a month, and uh, you get ex, you get to, get to see things that we find on live auctioneers and on value uh, and on valuable. Um, right now, Invaluable is being uncooperative with us. They're not letting us pull their links. But everything that's on Invaluable pretty much is on live auctioneers anyway. And we've added a whole bunch of content from the online Christie's sale that's coming up. So you can check all those out as well as uh, Bid Square. 
All right. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoy these. Leave a comment, and um, we'll be back uh, down in Massachusetts in a few days, and we'll do a video on the uh, auction results uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, they'll all be over by then. There's a couple of them going on today, and uh, we'll, we'll bring you up to speed and talk about what happened and how they did and give you our thoughts on it. Okay. Have a great weekend, and see you all in a couple of days. Bye-bye.